Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. So Taylor asked me to preach this Sunday about two months ago, and I said, sure, no problem, you know, I'll I'll be here. Um, And then I found out what the title of the sermon was going to be, because we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. This is the next passage from the Sermon on the Mount, and... um, Taylor wanted me to keep going, naturally. Um, So I said, the power of prayer? I'm not sure that's the right sermon for me. Um, I pray, you know, I I do that. Um, But I don't feel like I have any particular expertise in it. Um, And to be honest, uh, the other thing is sometimes... It's kind of hard to admit this, but what if prayer isn't powerful the way we think it is or the way we want it to be? Um, I've seen things that I prayed for happen just in the way that I prayed for them. Um, Very recently this summer, I was praying, as I know a lot of you were, for Bright Beginnings, that they would have a full enrollment in the fall, that their bottom line would work out, and it did. Um, They're not rolling in money, but they're uh, certainly sustainable for this year and hopefully next year too. But there are plenty of other times when I prayed and the course of events didn't go that way. I prayed for people who were sick and they died. I prayed for people who uh, needed jobs or needed a better job and that hasn't happened yet. And so what what do we do about that? And I realized as I was thinking through these things in my mind, I bet other people think those things too. I bet a lot of other people say, yeah, I pray, but I don't feel that good at it. And I bet other people say, yes, I pray, and sometimes things happen the way I prayed for, but sometimes they don't. So what about that? Sometimes we deal with these questions Uh, by saying things like, God always answers prayer, but sometimes his answer is wait, or sometimes the answer is no. Uh, We say things like, whenever God opens a door, closes a door, he opens a window. Um, These things may be true, but they're not really helpful when someone you love is dying, uh, or someone who needs to be able to support their family can't do it, and you're praying that those things will happen, and they don't. Sometimes, We use these phrases and we feel like the people Jesus talks about that have heavy burdens tied up and put on their backs. We feel like we don't have enough faith to accept God's answer. We feel like maybe we aren't praying hard enough. We feel like maybe God isn't answering our prayer because there's some sin in our lives that we haven't confessed or we haven't gotten rid of. But in contrast, uh, Jesus tells us that His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. So if we're praying in the way Jesus taught us to pray, it should be easy, it should be light. It should make us feel better, right? So when Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us by contrast. He shows us first what prayer shouldn't look like, so we can see better what prayer is. So let's go with Jesus and see what prayer is not. The first thing is that Jesus is clear that prayer doesn't give us power over other people. That's what the hypocrites in this passage are looking for. They go above and beyond the call of duty. They're not just fasting. They put makeup on. They suck their cheeks in, so they really look like they're fasting. And Jesus says that the attention those people get for doing that is its own reward. You don't get a reward from God if you're praying to impress other people. You get a reward from other people. And that's not prayer. Jesus tells us as well that prayer doesn't give us power over God. 
when our prayers are answered, when our prayers aren't answered, we can fall into the traps of doubt and shame. We wonder, did I do something wrong that God hasn't answered my prayer? Did I not believe enough? Am I not good enough? And the tendency is to try to cover those feelings up with religious stuff. We keep praying. If I pray hard enough, that'll really impress God, no matter what else I'm afraid is there. But Jesus is clear. God doesn't hear our prayer because we use a lot of words. And God doesn't hear our prayer because we impress him by praying so much. Prayer that attempts to be impressive to God, Jesus says, is not really prayer. And prayer doesn't even give us power over our own fears. Most of us are afraid. As I've said, we're afraid we're too sinful. We're afraid we're not disciplined enough. We don't pray every day. We feel bad about that. We're afraid we don't have enough faith. And prayer is an attempt, can be an attempt to deal with that fear, to cover it up. We attempt to impress others. If they think I'm really great at praying, maybe I'll feel like I am. We attempt to impress God. If we impress God and he thinks I'm great at prayer, maybe I'll really be great at prayer. We get the validation we want by praying. But what if God doesn't answer those prayers? We feel more shame. We can try even harder to prove to God and to other people that we're good enough. We're so used to carrying these burdens of needing faith, these burdens of needing to feel holy enough to pray, that we hardly even notice them most of the time. And when Jesus calls our attention to them in this passage, we realize how hobbled our prayers really are. So where is the power in prayer? I certainly don't have it. And from Jesus' words, it doesn't sound like any of you have it either. No offense intended. But Jesus does have this power in prayer. There's another book of the New Testament, uh, the letter to the Hebrews, that goes into great detail about the significance of Jesus' life, the significance of Jesus' ascension into heaven. Jesus, the writer of Hebrews says, offered up prayers and supplications during his time on earth as God's chosen high priest. And Jesus, the writer of this book says, is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary which the Lord himself has set up to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Let us approach, this book says, in full assurance of our faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean and our bodies washed. This book is a wonderful meditation on Jesus' meaning for believers and Jesus' meaning for the whole world. And I would encourage you to take probably only 45 minutes sometime this week and read through this whole letter. Um, recently I heard one of you say about a friend, he doesn't feel like he can pray anymore. So I told him not to worry, I would be praying on his behalf. And that's a wonderful blessing to receive from someone. I know people have said that to me in the past, and it's wonderful. But what an even more wonderful blessing it is to receive the Lord Jesus' prayers on our behalf. So the first power that prayer has is that prayer is done by Jesus. Jesus, the Bible tells us, is in heaven, in God's presence, constantly presenting our case and praying for all of us before God. We don't need to be impressively sinless to pray. We don't need to have any great faith to pray. Because Jesus prays, and his prayer is always accepted by his Father, who loves us totally and unconditionally for Jesus' sake, there's no need to impress God with our prayers. There's no need to convince ourselves that we don't sin or we don't have enough faith. There's no need to try to fool others to make them think our prayers are so great. You could hear all this and think, well, since Jesus is praying for me and for everyone else, maybe I don't need to pray. But Jesus doesn't just pray for us and teach us how to pray. He also gives us a new identity in prayer. When Jesus gives his disciples the Lord's Prayer, he says, pray in this way. When we pray in this way, we're not praying to impress others. It's a very simple prayer. Our language of our tradition of using kind of uh, archaic language in the Lord's Prayer may obscure this fact a little bit. 
But compared to the kinds of prayers that first century Jews might have prayed, or compared to the kinds of prayers that we may hear uh, people in church pray sometimes, it's pretty simple. It's short. It's not that complex. And when we pray in this way, we're not praying to impress God. God in this prayer isn't described in any special lofty language. A lot of Jewish blessings of this time began with something like, Blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe. And that's true. God is the King of the universe. But Jesus teaches us to address God by what's probably his least impressive title, Our Father. God has a lot of children who don't do much credit to his name. And if we're honest, we'll admit that we're among them. So Jesus doesn't teach us to tell God how much we've done to praise his name. He teaches us to ask forgiveness for all the dishonor we brought on his name. And when we pray in this way, we also, we can't fool ourselves. The first half of the prayer is all about God, his name, his kingdom, his will. We're not people who are concerned with our own names, our own kingdoms, and our own wills anymore. We're concerned with God's will and kingdom and name. The second half of the prayer is all about what we need, but it's also about what others need from us. If we pray this prayer, we can't become like the unfaithful servant who was forgiven much but was unwilling to forgive others. If we pray this prayer, we can't become like the rich man Jesus talks about in Luke who ignored the beggar's cries, who had his own daily bread, but didn't realize that Jesus' prayer says, our daily bread, not my daily bread. The identity that Jesus gives us in this prayer is the identity of Christian, literally meaning a little Christ. The word Christ simply means anointed one. Jesus is the Christ. He's anointed to carry out God's definitive act of salvation. But all of us who have been baptized are anointed, are Christ as well. We're anointed to forgive when we're sinned against. We're anointed to share our daily bread with those who are in need. We're anointed to help God's kingdom come on earth as it already exists in heaven. So in the Lord's Prayer, we not only hear Jesus' prayer on our behalf, Jesus' powerful prayer on our behalf, but we, re we receive a new identity as people who pray and who act along with Jesus on behalf of others. So that's, that's my first uh, problem with prayer, the problem of technique. You don't really need technique. Just pray this way. Pray that God's kingdom would come in the places you inhabit. Pray that those who share the earth's table with you would receive their daily bread. There's no need to be sinless to have an extraordinary amount of faith. Jesus has that covered. But what about the other problem I mentioned? The problem that it seems like God doesn't always answer our prayer. That's a very tough one. I'd like to read part of a story um, from the BBC that was written by a reporter named Peter Crutchley. Uh, he wrote this two years ago in remember remembrance of the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And the title of the article is did prayer bring down the Berlin Wall? Disillusioned with the Berlin Wall, the physical fault line of the ongoing Cold War, and the repressive East German regime, Pastor, Pastor Christian Fuhrer of the St. Nicholas Church in Leipzig began organizing prayers for peace every Monday evening, beginning in 1982. On many occasions, fewer than a dozen people attended the prayer meetings. The East German government strongly discouraged its citizens from becoming involved in religious activities, but the meetings continued every Monday without fail. In 1985, Pastor Fuhrer put an open-to-all sign outside the church. Such a gesture was loaded with symbolism, as the church provided the only space in East Germany where people could talk about things that couldn't be addressed in public. Meetings were open to everyone, Young people, Christians, atheists, all sought refuge there. Attendance soared as words of the peace prayers spread. On May 8, 1989, the authorities barricaded the streets leading to the church, hoping to put people off 
but it had the opposite effect, and the congregation grew. There were beatings and arrests of demonstrators at protest rallies in Leipzig, Berlin, and Dresden. By this time, the prayer meetings had led to a series of peaceful political protests in Leipzig and the other cities, which became known as the Monday demonstrations. For years, these prayer meetings had been largely ignored by the East German authorities due to the lack of numbers. But as the scale of the gatherings grew, the pastor and his followers were threatened and pressure was put on them to stop the meetings, but they remained resolute. Things came to a head on October 7, 1989, the 40th anniversary of the German Democratic Republic, East Germany. There were hundreds of arrests made around, among the crowds in front of the Nikolai Church. Erich Honecker, who was the communist leader of East Germany, had declared that the church should be closed. The police used brute force against the demonstrators, and lots of people were beaten. An article appeared in a local newspaper announcing that the counter-revolution would be put down on Monday, October 9th, with whatever means necessary. People involved in the meetings feared a bloodbath with the memory of the Tiananmen Square massacre in China fresh in their memories. The church was visited by doctors who told the pastor that hospital rooms had been made available for patients with bullet wounds. So we were absolutely terrified of what might happen, Pastor Fuhrer said. Up to 8,000 people crowded into the church that Monday night, including members of the Stasi, the secret police, who had been sent to occupy the church. Other Leipzig churches opened as well to accommodate additional protesters. About 70,000 people had gathered in the city. After an hour-long service at St. Nicholas, Pastor Fuhrer led the worshipers outside. The nearby Augustusplatz was filled with demonstrators clutching lit candles. Slowly, the crowd began walking around the city, past the Stasi headquarters, chanting, We are the people, and no violence. They were accompanied by thousands of helmeted riot police ready to intervene. The tension was palpable. But at the decisive moment, the police stood aside and let the protesters march by. Pastor Fuhrer said, They didn't attack. They had nothing to attack for. East German officials would later say, they were ready for anything except for candles and prayer. The late Brian Hanrahan, former diplomatic editor for the BBC News, reported and secretly filmed from Leipzig that night. Recalling the protest 20 years later, he said that he had since heard rumors that local communist officials had struck a last-minute deal defying Honecker by letting the march continue, as he reflected how close Leipzig came to a massacre. It took great personal courage to confront a government notorious for its ruthlessness, he said. There was a sense of foreboding that this was likely to end with a great deal of bloodshed. I found out just how close this came to happening. A massacre was just minutes away. This would prove to be a seismic moment. The fact that they had been met with no violence meant that the protest movement began to lose its fear. The dam had burst. Footage of the march was widely broadcast, which inspired Monday demonstrations throughout East Germany in the following weeks. About 120,000 people took to the streets in Leipzig the following Monday. Eric Honegger resigned two days later. The dissidents became increasingly emboldened, with around 300,000 people taking part in the protests on October 23rd. Exactly a month after the events of October 9th, the Berlin Wall came down amid scenes of jubilation witnessed around the world. So to answer the article's question, did prayer bring down the Berlin Wall? Well, were the people at St. Nicholas especially holy or full of faith? No, I don't think they were. But I think they knew what we knew. They knew that, people, that Jesus prays for his people to be delivered from the time of trial and to be rescued from the evil one. They knew that their identity was to practice and share peace, even if it cost them their lives. They knew that God's kingdom had already come in Jesus. They knew that Jesus, God's kingdom had come in healing the sick, but they knew that God's kingdom had also come in Jesus' being nailed through his hands and feet and hung until he was dead. 
They knew that God's kingdom had come in peace. They knew that the original disciples had grown to love each other in a way that they had never known before. But they knew that God's kingdom also came in a sword. Many of those first disciples were killed because of the peace that Jesus had given them. Even if the massacre had come that night, God's people would still be delivered. Their identity as God's anointed ones would still be intact. God's kingdom would still have been known in East Germany and throughout the world. So is it wrong to pray for healing? Is it wrong to pray for justice? Not at all. But we have to remember first to pray for what we know is God's will. That we would forgive others, that we would share our bread with others, that God's kingdom would come on earth as it already is in heaven, that we would carry Jesus' peace, that we would carry Jesus' love and Jesus' message of healing to all people. That is our identity as God's anointed ones. That is what Jesus is always praying for us in heaven. Those prayers will always be answered. Amen.